Welcome to the segmentation portion of the tutorial. In this video we will first go over a segmentation and shape analysis workflow using classic segmentation techniques available in Simple ADK. While the dominant segmentation approaches today are based on deep learning, the classic techniques are still useful when you have very little data and it is unique in its characteristics. So models trained on similar data are not available. In the second part of the video, we'll go over a notebook illustrating how to evaluate segmentation results, irrespective of how they were obtained. Finally, just a reminder, you can use registration to perform segmentation. Uh, think atlases. So if you haven't watched the uh, registration portion of the uh, tutorial, please go watch that video. Uh, if you're interested in that type of approach. And without further ado, we can start looking at the workflow that we're going to uh, use. So the data that we're working with is a focused ion beam scanning electron microscopy image. So it's uh, microscopy images of bacterium. And these are a uh, tubular shaped uh, objects in the uh, volume we'll see those shortly and as usual we get uh, set up our environment load our images and look at them so these are the bacteria and we can scroll through the volume and see all these uh, nice bugs in there what we would like to do is segment them and only use a complete bacteria that we segment. So if they're cut off by the edge of the volume, something like this, we don't want to deal with that uh, because that won't let us analyze its shape or content. And again, if it's cut off at one of the edges, uh, it's hard to uh, visualize this whole thing when we're going slice by slice, but uh, Essentially, we just want to segment these bacterium and afterwards analyze their size, uh, uh, additional aspects of their shape. So the first thing is that we will separate the bacteria from the embedding resin, which is the background. Mark each uh, potential bacteria with a unique label because we do want to segment them on a bacteria-based basis remove small components and then we use watershed and finally uh, remove anything that is close to touching the borders of the image because we're not sure that's a complete bacterium. So let's start by just looking at this data, the histogram of the volume and if you look at it it's uh, quite surprising in that this is a bimodal Gaussian distribution uh, it's what you read of in textbooks, that your data will look like this and we can have optimal thresholds based on if this is uh, the behavior of your data. And in simple ITK for uh, binary thresholding we have a variety of thresholds here. Uh, what I did in this case is I placed all of them into a dictionary and then we use this structure to essentially uh, mimic a switch statement that which is available in other languages. In Python you mimic it using a dictionary where you just access it and then uh, if uh, you can't access you have an exception and you do something else. In this case uh, I set the filter selection to manual which is none of these and let's see what happens with that and the selected threshold is uh, 120 and we can see that it seems to have done a decent job of separating the background and foreground. Uh, we might want to use something more robust in the sense that it is data driven so let's go for Atsu. You can uh, try your own and you can see it's not that different from the manual thresholding selection. So it's 119 was the threshold that the Atsu filter computed. And the results look very similar. So uh, nothing too exciting. Th these are standard approaches. 
But the nice thing is that this is an ideal case for using the Atsu threshold where you have this bimodal structure, uh, which is what it's designed for. So now that we've uh, sort of segmented the foreground from the background, let's look at the statistics of uh, these labels. So this is uh, a, a oh, one thing that I did forget to say is after the segmentation, this threshold-based segmentation, uh, we have a threshold image, thresh image. Uh, in SimpleITK, we have a trivial filter, which is called label overlay. It takes an image, takes a, a label image, which can have a binary, only binary label or multiple labels, and it overlays it onto the original image, and you can display it, which is what we're seeing here. It's a combination of the labels, and in this case, because it's just a binary threshold, all of these are the same label, which is one. So uh, that's that. Now we would like to look at the uh, statistics of uh, these uh, and essentially separate them so that not all of them are just one because they're not a single object. So for that, we use the connected component uh, filter and that essentially separates the those that are not connected to each other. So let's see how that does. Uh, and the way that we analyze the results from the connected component is just uh, using the label statistics image filter. We just want to uh, find out how many uh, labels actually exist uh, afterwards. Excuse me, uh, we're, we're we, yeah, we just run the, the statistics filter and see how, how, many comp how many separate components did we actually get there. And wow, that's not what you would expect. There are not 30, more than 30,000 objects in that image. There are probably several hundred maybe, but not several tens of thousands. So we must be uh, over-segmenting and having a lot of tiny... Uh, single islands here which are just not visible uh, this way when we're uh, at this resolution looking at the image. So let's see if we can remove, we'll remove the uh, any small islands and fill holes using a binary morphology operation. So we uh, use an opening to remove small islands and this is on the binary image, and we have a, 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 a structuring element that is 10 by 10 by 10. And uh, after the opening, we do closing, and set again on the clean threshold the, the image, and the result should be removal of all the tiny islands and closing of any uh, small holes that are there. And again, if you want the larger, uh, to remove larger islands, you would use a larger uh, structuring element. Smaller uh, components, you use a smaller uh, structuring element. And this is a, a computationally intensive uh, operation, so it takes some time. So bear with me. And again, Let's see if we can compare. Let's see if there's some region where, yep, okay. So let's zoom in on this bacterium. Let's see, let's start by seeing where it's slice 182. Let's zoom on this bacterium and we can see all these holes and stuff happening there. That's not great. Let's go to slice 182. And let's zoom in again on that same bacterium. And you can see this is continuous, contiguous object versus all these holes that we had there. So the, oper the binary morphology operations did what they're supposed to do. Remove small islands and fill in small holes. So we're happy with the, that result. Now let's see how many objects we actually have in this modified image. Again, same uh, approach, 
getting connected components so that it's not one big binary uh, object. It's they're going to be separated and label statistics image filter will just do the statistics on those labels. And we seem to have far fewer objects, it's about 10 for this size, I don't know, six for this size, but we seem to have one object that is humongous, has a huge number of pixels associated with it. Let's see how that manifests visually. And in a second again, we're overlaying those separate labels. So we have these are belong to the same structure. And all of these cyan are actually connected together. They don't seem to be connected when you look at a single slice, but there's leakage in 3D where in, they, at some point in the 3D volume, they touch each other. So uh, the, uh, they belong essentially to the same object. And that's not good. We would like to separate them. So what are we going to do? Uh, we're going to modify those uh, that object, th those th the resulting uh, set of label maps. And here we use a distance map, and we're going again. We're going to refer to the whole thing as a single binary object, and that's what happens here. Clean threshold image, which is these when it was separated, not equal zero. So we're going to, going to look at the whole thing as one object and we're going to create a distance map and then uh, create a con on the distance image we uh, anything that is below uh, uh, this radius because this is a sign distance map so we're looking inside the object anything that is uh, less than in this case 10 pixels away from the boundary we would like to keep that and those uh, and we use connected component to uh, get those and those will be seeds for our uh, watershed and again relabeling them is just uh, allows us to remove any small objects that are rem remaining there and it orders them so they're uh, numbered uh, uniquely. And then afterwards we just run a watershed using the distance image and those uh, seeds as the seed points and uh, that's pretty much it. And let's look at the data here. This is how the uh, segmentation distance map looks. So uh, that's that. The watershed seeds, we took this distance map and anything that was inside the object 10 pixels away from the border, those would serve as seeds and we're highlighting those here. These are these objects. We can scroll through these volumes together just to see how they change, you know. Uh, and finally this is the result of the watershed and this looks pretty good this is what we would like to be using uh, for analyzing the shape the bacteria shape they look to be well segmented even here when they're touching they're well segmented and but uh, what you should notice and I already iterated this several times is that Bacteria that are touching the boundaries of the uh, volume, we don't want to deal with those because we're not sure that they're complete bacteria. And in this case, it's clearly that they were cut off by the uh, volume. So we need to uh, clean that. And for that, there's a filter binary grind peak, which uh, we're using in combination here the image is not equal to zero because it has a small black boundary. Let's see if we can see that here. If I can zoom in, we might be able to see. No, just a second. Let's see in which regions
Okay. Here. Okay. So you can see we don't want to touch this stuff either where there is a, a border. You can see that here. This is some padding that the original data had. So again, we just remove those objects touching the boundary and we'll see what we get. And ooh, it seems that this is very conservative because you can see this seems to be okay. This bacteria is fine here, but let's try to follow it. And eventually it gets too close to the boundary to the border. Uh, here you can see that it's already cropped from the border so nope we can't use this bacterium even though uh, this bacterium seems to be uh, mostly contained within the volume because we uh, don't know you know is it mostly uh, in the volume or is it you know half in the volume like this uh, bacterium here so we just anything touching the boundary we just uh, get rid of it and we're retaining all of these bacterium because we know these are complete uh, objects that are inside the volume. Okay, so now we have a set of objects and we'd like to analyze them. For that we have a label shape statistics image filter and it has a variety of uh, computations that it does by default some of the computations are turned off because they require uh, they're more computationally complex and most often they're not the uh, values that they they compute are not used so by default those options are turned off if you go and look at the label shape statistics image filter the documentation it will tell you what's turned off by default you can turn it on which is exactly what I'm doing here for every uh, label it will compute an oriented bounding box so I need to tell the filter before applying it turn this option on and then when I execute it it will do that uh, we also have a label uh, intensity statistics image filter, exactly what the name says. It uh, uh, will compute the uh, statistics on the intensities. Uh, and uh, it receives uh, a mask, essentially the segmentation and the image, because it needs to know what, what uh, per label, it will compute the intensity statistics underlying that label in the image. So those are two things. So we will be computing shape statistics and the intensity statistics per label. And uh, what uh, are the shape statistics? You can get the physical size, the elongation, how flat it is, the oriented bounding box size. Uh, in this case, it's the uh, XY, uh, the mean uh, intensity inside the label, the standard deviation of the label, the skewness of, uh, excuse me, not the label, the intensities, the standard deviation of the intensities that belong to that label, the skewness of the uh, uh, dis uh, intensity distribution that belongs to that label, and so forth. So you can do a variety of computations per object that you've just segmented. And given that we're working in Python, the natural thing is to embed everything into a pandas data frame. One thing to note, though, uh, when computing sizes and uh, things of that nature, in simple ITK and ITK, we're agnostic to the units of the uh, pixel spacing. So we don't know if it's millimeters or kilometers or uh, microns. And in this case, it would be microns because we're working with microscopy, but it is up to you. Excuse me, I see it's nanometers here. It's fine. So the developer is responsible for associating specific units with the uh, measurements. So we're giving you the volume in physical units, but we don't know what those units exactly are. So it's up to you to say, yeah, it's non nanometers cubed in this case. So again, uh, create that. And Again, we can create or do all kinds of nice things with uh, Python and compute uh, correlations between the different uh, 
features that we just computed for each of the uh, image uh, labels. So elongation here versus uh, volume in this case, and you get the, this uh, uh, plot and so forth, flatness versus volume and so forth. So uh, they don't need, uh, again, you can discern a variety of patterns between uh, size uh, the, and possibly intensities and so forth. So again, a variety of computations you can do. That's very problem specific that you need to work with. And finally, because we have an oriented bounding box for each of these uh, bacterium, we can essentially do a lineup of all these bacterium and cr crop them out of the volume, the original volume, and look at them one by one. So now each of these bacterium, this is oriented bounding box number 136. It's one of those bacterium there, and we can just, if you're uh, interested in building an atlas for these bacterium to see a variety of changes in them, this is what you would do. You would get the, them segmented out and then analyze the differences beyond the, uh, the ones that we already did there. So again, a variety of these, I just uh, got a bunch of them out of the volume and then we can visualize them separately. And that's it for a, a traditional uh, classical uh, segmentation workflow using simple ITK components. In the next notebook, we're dealing with a much broader subject and that is segmentation evaluation. And uh, segmentation evaluation, uh, two things that uh, we need to do. And that is first, you have to have a reference segmentation. Uh, we don't refer to it as a ground truth or gold standard because those are never known unless you're using artificial images uh, simulation. But if you're, uh, you have an acquired image, the ground truth is never known. A radiologist might segment a, a tumor, but that is one a clinician's opinion with respect to the segmentation. If you want to tease out a better reference data set, you would use a algorithm that would combine multiple uh, uh, opinions from uh, professionals or from uh, crowdsourcing and the combination in simple ITK, two options, either majority vote or the simultaneous truth and performance level estimation algorithm, staple, both of these are available in simple ITK. Now that we have a reference segmentation, we need to compare to it. You have a new segmentation from your deep learning algorithm, from your classical uh, segmentation workflow, it doesn't matter. Uh, we have uh, standard ways of evaluating how well did the algorithm perform, and those uh, include uh, overlap measures, surface distance measures, and volume measures. One thing to note, though, uh, is that uh, this is very nice in a theoretical standpoint, but from practical standpoints, uh, some of these might be more appropriate than others. It depends on your context. For instance, if you're segmenting very small objects, let's say a needle in an ultrasound volume or a tiny tumor in a, a organ, dice and jacquard, the overlap measures, are not necessarily that appropriate because uh, your object is so tiny that a small change, you know, you uh, missed one pixel, that will uh, change the uh, dice coefficient significantly, even though it has very little clinical implications. So it really is context dependent. So just telling you I got a dice of 0.8, or let's say I got a dice of 0.9 and I'm segmenting the whole lung, then that might not be really good because segmenting the whole lung, that's a huge object. 
you might have quite a, a, a significant difference at the borders and you still get a 0.9. But if you're segmenting a needle and you missed a couple of pixels or you're slightly offset by one millimeter, then you might get you know a 0.7 dice and that sounds pretty bad, but in practice it's good enough for your purposes. So without uh, having s all caveated all of that, let's start looking at the actual notebook. Again, running the setup, uh, display with overlay just uh, uh, allows us to display a, an image with a segmentation. What I'm using here is I take a label map contour overlay. So instead of overlaying uh, the whole label alpha blended onto the original, I'm using a contour from that label. So I just need a label map and I'll uh, overlay the contour. And an additional thing is that uh, I need to use intensity windowing to map the, my original image, which is high dynamic range, to a low dynamic range so that I can merge both uh, my, uh, my uh, original image and the uh, label overlay onto it. And here you can see I'm controlling the opacity of the uh, contour. I'm setting it to completely opaque to 1. Uh, 0.5 if you want alpha blending, but it's because this is a contour, usually I use a uh, one uh, contour thickness. You can control that if you want it thicker or thinner. It uh, depends on your usage. If you're going to use it for a publication, you might not want a thicker uh, contour so that it looks better in, the, uh, in your uh, paper. So let's start by just fetching our data. And this is a CT with a, a tumor segmented somewhere in there. Let's see where here. It's we've got it segmented in multiple slices, and these are segmentations that come from multiple radiologists. So you can see this one did this segmentation. This is looks significantly different. Another person and another person slightly different, but seems to be closer. These two seem to be closer than this one, which marked it this way. Again, three clinicians, three opinions. They're close to each other, but still different. So first things first, let's derive, try to tease out the uh, ground truth. Uh, the staple algorithm is designed for a binary uh, uh, decisions here and it outputs a, a probabilistic uh, result. We set a threshold of 0.95 and what I did here is add the result from uh, the staple to uh, the uh, previous segmentation. So it will be added as the last uh, volume. So let's take a look again. Uh, that difference. These are the first radiologists and second that sort of seem to agree with each other and the a staple sort of is some compromise. You can see there is a difference between this and this and this and obviously this guy. So this will serve as our ground truth and as all things simple ITK it is doing the work in 3D. So while we're looking at things on a slice-based approach, everything here is doing it in 3D. So uh, overlap measures. I'm defining here a set of enumerated values, distance measures also here. And uh, again, we have a label overlap measures image filter. So not, not something, uh, you know, too surprising. It will compute uh, the uh, overlap measures. And Hausdorff distance image filter. And now to compute uh, surface distances between the two objects and the statistics on those, we use uh, distance maps. So we have to compute distance maps ourselves and do some math that happens here. Uh, I'll leave it to you to go and look at the details. Uh, 
it's pretty straightforward. You, once you have a distance map and you have the other surface, you just look at the values of the distance map un under that label. So uh, again, the intensity statistics, uh, label intensity statistics filter is uh, very useful. And let's just run this and the result is, well, we get just a bunch of numbers in a, a, a NumPy array. Uh, but that's the, not really nice, and we're in Python uh, world, so we let's put everything inside a, a in a pandas data frame, and we can display it using HTML and tell the data frame plot all the you know bar graphs and do them nicely. So it's really uh, with this is the amount of the amount of code that you need for actually creating nice presentations of your uh, results. And again, the uh, jacquard, dice, volume similarity, false negative, false positive, a variety of uh, ways of evaluating your segmentation, trivial way of plotting them and saving them to file. Again, in the end, the goal is uh, that wonderful pub publication you're working on. So have nice graphs there. You might uh, muck around with the uh, colors and so forth. These are pretty much the defaults. And finally, if you're working in LaTeX, and I do hope you are, then you can essentially output the uh, uh, re your results. Once they're in the pandas data frame, you can just output them uh, and copy this code into your LaTeX paper and that really does uh, improve your reproducible science because you won't make any mis mistake copying it from here you know from uh, let's start from from this uh, annoying uh, numpy ar uh, array approach or this pandas approach that's not uh, what you want you don't want to copy that just copy this whole text and you won't have an error uh, you know uh, and finally, when you have larger uh, objects, it's nice to see where these discrepancies are because this is just, these are summary statistics. It's giving a very broad overview of that you have segmentation differences, what their sizes are, but where are they in space? Are they close to the center of your object? Are they... Uh, at some edge, is it the right edge of the uh, object that is under segmented, or is it the left edge that is under segmented? These don't tell you anything about that, and you uh, often or you should be interested in is there a spatial bias to your segmentation? And you can do a you can just look at the differences between the uh, segmentation. In this case, our object is pretty small, so it's uh, going to be a bit hard to see and in a second and it's barely visible here let's see so what I did is I took the volume looked at the created the differences and tiled the slices one after the other into a single long image and these are the differences I set the background to white and uh, so that it would uh, what do, we do not want to waste ink and again if you get a completely white background you the result is completely white that means you have a perfect segmentation there's no difference in this case we can see certain differences in certain slices and uh, these are marked here and with that we conclude the segmentation portion of the tutorial